Arr, grog. Hello and welcome to the Cider Shed podcast. It's just me, Peter Fickling, and Matthew Weir again. Kerry's in the departure lounge of some Spanish airport, um, clutching a straw donkey and an Ikea bag full of duty-free. Um, she's preparing her journey home to see us all. So, Matthew, what's foreign for welcome home? Well, it depends where you are, doesn't it? I mean, if you were saying welcome to Portugal, you'd say benvindo. What do you think they're going to say to Kerry when she gets back? Well, I have it on good authority from Kerry that uh, basically, you know, if you're travelling to uh, another country, there's all number of well-organised um, hoops for you to jump through to, um, you know, um, become COVID secure and enjoy your time in your foreign uh, foreign destination of choice. But coming home, you can pretty much say what you want and they just waltz you through. Um, so I think she'll be back in back in her bed in Brighton, um, you know, in no time. Okay, yeah, she was due to board her flight around 10 o'clock Spanish time, wasn't she? So I was hoping that we're recording a little earlier tonight, but I was hoping to actually track her on flight radar as we were doing the show. And if the plane suddenly turns around over France, I guess that they'd run, ran out of ham on sandwiches and she'd ordered them to go back to Palma Air. Uh, well, there's nothing there's nothing healthier than stalking a, a colleague live on air. I think that's... Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, Kerry would Kerry would want me to say that uh, uh, she will be obeying all the rules and regulations when she gets back, and will be obviously um, obeying the laws of our country. I know you know that goes without saying. Uh, Kerry is an incredibly law-abiding and um, sensible woman. I concur. Is there is how can we do a neat segue from the phrase "sensible woman" to some to Alice? I don't know. Oh yeah, she's not at all, and she's got this <laughs> madcap um, scheme going on where she's going to she's invited some kind of familial um, hater launch that's going to kind of bear down on her at her rehab centre. I mean, being serious, it does sound like quite a sensible thing to go through, if not agonising. Isn't it tough love this approach when you're you are faced down by the people you've hurt? I know that some some programs they require you once you once you have um, recovered that you have to go around and apologize to people as part of one of the stages. Um, but I know that there's also this stage when people are often still in rehab that they have to be confronted. It's, uh, what's it called? It's, and it's the intervention is the one that they generally do at home, isn't it? Where yeah. everyone has to bring a written statement and say that what you did hurt me and this is why. And so the person can realize that. And I guess it seems... Alice, in conjunction with the facility, have, have asked Jenny, Brian, and Chris to come in with a letter each. But we had we had that whole everything is self contained in one episode, wasn't there? Brian thought it was all um, modern nonsense, and then con- then proceeded to reel off all these terrible things that Alice had done. <laughs> you just there like put it in the letter, Brian. Yeah, that'll Jen- do it. Yeah, Jenny kind of managed to get him to do that. And by the end of the, the episode, he he cottoned on. But I don't know what you think of that approach. I do like the idea that it's, uh, so in, she's invited it, you know, I mean, and you assume willingly. I mean, they can't, they can't sort of uh, twist someone's arm into that at a, at, a, at a place like that, one assumes. Um, so I think that, you know, that, that could make it quite healthy. I mean, the, the problem is, of course, it's the archers. So the three people she's inviting to come in, are to her occasionally hysterical mother, her um, you know now confessed dipsomaniac and um, really quite aggrieved, and it sounds like PTSD suffering father, and her you know mentally subnormal husband. <laughs> so you know, will it work? Um, you know, in the real world, potentially. Far much more fun to get Emma in to write a letter. I thought. No, no, just one more hour <laughs> and <laughs> <the other> thing. <laughs> yeah. Just reams of reams of paper coming out of the room that through the clinic and out yeah. down the driveway. Poor Ed wordlessly padding in and out from the car park <laughs> with another wheelbarrow sort of you know, um, you know, double line paper. Yeah. I did have a little daydream where sort of like Alice had sort of um, corrupted the whole thing and they get there and she's like, Well, hello and welcome. Take a seat. And she's doing a kind of like drunk voice. And just it, the whole thing's been an elaborate setup, and she just start, just starts tearing into them. I mean, you never know; that could end up happening anyway. Yeah, is it going to be plain sailing? I I don't think so. And will we hear it? Yeah, I hope I think so because they're setting it up as Monday's episode. Well, as Monday, so I I think we might hear them on the in their final preparations on Sunday. Is it too late for me to book a week off next week? I mean, it's my <laughs> turn. <laughs> You can if you like. Carrie will be back in all her glory. I mean, yeah. 
I'm I'm start all. Do you remember a couple of weeks ago? I said I'm, one of my fears was that we're going to we're we're still missing out on key things, and then they completely blew my theory out of the water. And they showed the Casey well, they played the Casey wedding. Um, so I think I think we get to hear this. I'm pretty sure we do. Yeah, and they have with the Alice plotline. They haven't um, shirked any of these things. They have given us the full kind of warts and all experience. Um, even you know, I mean, God, I just remembered the the uh, hallucinated baby in the bath. So oh, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll hear it next week, no doubt. Yes, I just um, I think if anything, the the person who seemed uh, Brian, obviously, I consider him as a unit with Jenny. They're working on this letter. How, what do you think Chris puts together? What's he going to say? Because he seemed a little like almost like he stepped away from it a bit when his conversations with Amy. Well, maybe he'll use his art to try and speak to her and make her a tree out of iron. Um, I mean, that seems to be his main form of kind of like creative expression or communication. I mean, I don't know. He's not the ma- So he, he had that long chat with Amy and you you really didn't get a sense of a, of a particularly complex or sort of deep thinker. I do remember ages ago talking about the fact that Chris had been a sort of peripheral figure and actually the Alice plotline was the first time that we'd started to see any kind of um, extra depths or kind of dimensions to him. And then, and then here we were after this whole experience. And when he was having that, that conversation with Amy, I just, I just really didn't feel like he was like a fully rounded or interesting character. I mean, you know, the, 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 the best example of that was when he was trying to sell that dinner he bought to, um, Neil and Susan. I was just like, yeah, this guy's. There's nothing there. Yeah, and he's he's also suddenly parenting again after apparently just not being available at all for about six weeks, which has pushed Susan to the limit. And suddenly he's back, ultra responsible. He's going to move back into the nest and needs to stand on his own two feet again when he, he's been so dependent on others. So it seemed like a, a real gear shift all of a sudden that didn't seem natural. And Susan sort of said it herself, like, you know, how's he going to cope? I mean, he he's kind of, well, he he did suggest that they're just, that his folks are just around the corner, but it's not, you know, that's not the thing with a, you know, the thing about a small child is you don't, it, it, it all works in minutes and tens of minutes. It's not like you can kind of plan and, oh, you know, and they'll pop across at seven and then, at eight o'clock, they'll head home again. I mean, it, I mean, uh, it's it seems very all or nothing. Isn't the nest like completely opposite in relation to where Jenny and Brian are now, or have I imagined that? I have almost no sense of the layout of the village whatsoever. I've got, I've got a feeling that like you can see the nest from from where Jenny and Brian live now, but I, I might have that wrong. Someone else can tell me if I've got that wrong, but I, I think that's the case. Yeah, I I, I thought it was just like you know, you, uh, there's just a sort of hedge studded and impregnated with thousands of empties and so it kind of looks like a kind of crystal palace glinting in the sun just those kind of piles of alice's spent bottles are we ever going to get closure on who made the scarecrow outside the bull that's what i want to know i mean was was i right in my supposition and lots of other people's supposition that it was alice's kind of you know um self-flagellating um farewell before she kind of like fled the village yes i i think once we'd realized it wasn't alice herself we had to go with the other option which was that it was alice had made it so yeah. i don't know if that'll ever get referenced again whether she's back out or not but- i know i mean obviously the archers community is a large one and um, anyone who's you know you've got your you've got your very smart list archers listeners and you've got your not so smart archers listeners so i you know and i, I think the script writers are aware of that i mean they, they might be they might feel the need to tidy it up it does feel like a fairly big omission just to say, if you're listening to this podcast, you're one of the smart ones. Uh, yeah, I'd say so. I mean, I haven't, no, honestly, I haven't seen any evidence to the contrary. I haven't seen a stupid, um, the cider shedder or whatever. Do we have, no, but we don't have a, a name for anyone who listens to the show yet. And, um, but you know, what? I think that's quite healthy. And long may it continue. Yeah, exactly. It's about, I always very suspicious of those kind of, um, self-anointed communities. Yeah. Without getting too much into it. Um, we were kind of put on the naughty step last week for bad language, but we had so much. Um, so, and that was before the, the the last episode went out, where we actually did list all the things you can and cannot say, which you expertly bleeped, Peter. But the <laughs> feedback from people was so um, reassuring. <laughs> Someone actually said they wanted thirty percent more bad language in yeah. one of the uh, in the bits of the feedback. So yeah, 
Um, so yeah, we we uh, we understand that you're all a very very intelligent bunch, and we appreciate you very much. And now I now I'm feeling incredibly stupid because I'm completely lost. Where were we? Uh, we were talking about Chris not being a very rounded character. Yeah. So before we disappeared up our own asses, yeah, um, yeah. No. So he's thick as pig shit, and um, <laughs> I. I, yeah, I don't think he's going to be contributing a huge amount. And also, the other thing is, every time I've heard him talk about Alice, it's I mean, actually this is a slight exaggeration, but it it always it's always been what how it affects him, what you know, what the effect on him and Martha is. And I guess as a parent, you can sort of you know argue that he, maybe he's focused on his daughter, blah 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 blah. But it's always very obvious. Like he 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 doesn't he never shows the imagination to sort of sort of try and um, decode why Alice might have got there, which kind of speaks to a sort of like a fairly dysfunctional relationship. Like, you know, the fact that I just don't, anyway, I don't know. Does that make any sense? Yeah. But that came from the top, didn't it? That came from Peggy. She said, just cut and run. If it, you've got to think of yourself and Martha. And I think that has stuck with him and he's even repeated it himself in not so many, um, not so many words. Didn't didn't uh, Peggy go back on that when she was talking to Jenny? She went back on it to Jenny and she went back on it to Alice, but Jenny pretty much... Well, Alice went round there to have it out with her after Kate got her all fired up and then um, Peggy apologised and Peggy had also apologised to Jenny before, which is how Alice and Kate got wind of it, but Jenny still isn't really speaking to Peggy. So I doubt that either of those have gone to Chris and said, oh, by the way, Gran and, or Mum said that she, she was wrong to say what she said. So I think Chris is still rattling along, thinking he's 100% doing the right thing. And maybe he is. Isn't the human brain remarkable that we can store this much nonsense? So I know. In our head. Just think you've got whole lobes full of Archer's Tosh. Yes, and I'm, you know, I'm starting to worry. Was it that theory that Conan Doyle? Well, I guess it was Conan Doyle's theory, but it was Sherlock Holmes that the mind is finite, like an attic, and information are, it's like boxes. And if you put, if you have to put certain things in, then certain other things must be pushed out. So what are we, what are we losing from listening to the archers? Well, I, I was I was going to take it a step further and say, what on earth has Joe Pasquale um, edged out of my brain? This Charlie <laughs> is using up space in my brain. I can remember at least 10 things that man's done. Wow. Okay. He's, I do you know what, until you mentioned his name there, I probably hadn't thought about that human for at least a decade. Yeah. And what's the other one? Um, the guy who plays Keith Lemon and he's now um, doing that show with him. Anyway, the, the point, yeah, um, we're, we're make, it's the same point again and again. Yeah. The, he's the, now you, doing that show with Amanda Holden. Is, oh, okay. Because I've almost completely ignored that, but that's him, is it? Yeah, it's it's the it's the show it's the show that was put on Earth to make Mrs. Brown's boys seem like a kind of a, a cultural high point, almost kind of you know, um, glime born desk. Glime born. So he and he plays her gran in that. That's the thing. Yeah, it's appalling. Okay. I mean, Chris, I mean, Chris will love it. I mean, essentially, what's happened there is it. I saw the title and I saw a quick bit of the trailer, and then I saw Keith Lemon's name mentioned, and I thought, "Oh, that's him." Then is it? Essentially, what's happened is it's it's five to five on a fr- Friday, and someone's just gone, "Golden Girls, get Amanda Holden in, and we'll call it Holden Girls," and they've all gone down the pub. That's basically what's happened there, isn't it? The moment I saw it was uh, obviously when you have a toddler, your you know cliche time. Your your remote control is no longer you know yours. It, it, it suddenly it lives, but you know between cushions or it's been pushed under the sofa. So you know mm-hmm. that you don't just wordlessly grab it from the place it was always sits. So you know they came up on the TV, and I think I was only capturing you know, capturing tiny glimpses of it as I scrambled desperately around the room to try and find you know the ability to turn them off as quickly as possible. Okay, well I'm very lucky in that I'm so detached from what is on UK TV these days. Um, yeah, you see you when you're Brazilian soaps, isn't it? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> we're now uh, we're now Kevin Bacon steps away from <laughs> our original <laughs> topic. So Chris Chris is not going to be useful. Brian is going to be uh, you know Brian could be useful if he can if he can find the words and get them down. Although he sounded very beaten up. And Jenny is rolling up her sleeves to be a good mum, which you know despite all my criticism, she definitely does her best to be. Um, and we both agree, I think, that if, if I'm sorry to sort of like put words into your mouth, did, did we sort of vaguely agree that if Alice is inviting this, it could be a good thing? Yeah, I think so. 
I think so. But as we said, in good intentions, let's see where it goes. Yeah, I, I do. I will bitterly accept that having invested so much time into this plot line, it will be probably quite a moving. And they have written some of these more heightened scenes. And Alice, the actress who plays Alice, acts them very, very well. So um, I think, you know, and, you know, all the actors involved are, are very good. So, I, you know, I think it could be something to look forward to. Yeah, that's one of the shames about this, isn't it? Drunk Alice is so well done. Yeah. That in order for Alice, Alice to be a success, we're not going to hear Drunk Alice anymore. True. Although, you know, down the line... Down, I mean, down, but, but this is the thing. I mean, act, act, actors come and go in the show. So, I mean, down the line, if they ever have to um, sort of interview for a, a replacement Alice, it's going to be like, come on then, let's, let's not mess around. Let's hear your drunk Alice. You know, <laughs> she's yeah. having a relapse. Um, that's gonna, it's a lit, one hell of a litmus test. With Alice and Chris, they're a 50% dull couple. You know, Chris kind of, but, you know, there's no way you could call Alice dull. Um on the other side of the village, you have two of the dullest pairings you'll ever find, have committed to to the radio. Uh, Beth and Ben. Yeah, and of course. Well, the aim going back to who we were talking about, Amy and Chris. Although they're not quite the pairing. Yes, of course. Yeah, Chris. Chris is uh, Chris is being dull in in you know on two fronts. I forgot about that. Yeah, I mean Sunday's episode. Amy and Chris bump into each other at the shops. Amy just seems to be stockpiling chocolate for some reason, if you noticed. I don't know why. Every time that she was um, throughout Monday, was it Monday's episode and Sunday's, that she just seemed to be um, buying loads of cakes and chocolate and living her best life. Is it too early to find deeper meaning in that? No, she referenced this herself. She said that she was worried she wouldn't fit back into her uniform when she went back to Nottingham. Um, but, you know, she's free to do it. I've 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 pigged out all the way through the school holidays, so I'm not one to talk. But so, you know, Amy talking to Chris seemed to just be a vehicle to nurse explain the effects of COVID <laughs> to Chris, which is fine because obviously it's a very serious issue. Um, and then, do you think there is something going to happen between these two? There's a lot of chatter about it on social media. Yeah. Yeah, that, I mean, I don't. I really don't want it to happen. Um, not for any, not for any particularly altruistic or kind of sensitive reasons, but just I just I can't be bothered with it. Um, and also, I don't remember Amy being that dull. But as you say, she was. You know, the the character, the actress, were being forced into a very kind of um, BBC uh, health announcement um, sort of like shaped uh, um, hole. So. It was all a bit. It was all a bit clumsy. The two takeaways from Sunday were that COVID is quite a strain on the health service. Um, Ed is going to rig the flower and produce show, and that Brian says sell your lambs now before we strike a trade deal with Australia and New Zealand. So it was all. Um, oh, I missed all that. informative. Oh, so they covered they covered COVID and Brexit. That's yes, good. yeah, yeah, they did. They got it all out of the way on Sunday night. Have they, have they, well, okay, I'm looking forward to next Sunday when they they sort of blithely mention, Adam blithely mentions over the dinner table to Ian that, you know, um, Britain has fallen out of the top 10 of Germany's trading partners. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait for that. Over a, over a tagine, hopefully. Yes. Well, of course, yeah. Yeah, well, that new that new trade deal with Morocco will be great for your, for your kitchen implements, Ian. That was real world depressing. I was quite sort of, I don't know, it was one of these kind of, um, these markers of our decline. Has there ever been a duller conversation than Beth and Ben down by the river? And I, I held Ben in pretty high esteem up until this point. I was quite shocked by how inept he was. And then, sorry to sort of change tack and sort of go into rant mode, incredibly annoyed. I was almost screaming at the radio at just how fast it was that a, a couple of their age could be put under strain by a guy flip-flopping from one in relationship to the other because he fancied her more. Like, it just seemed completely implausible, or am I being overly cynical? Completely implausible. I mean, I, from, from my memory of being in teens, it was basically girls saying to me, are you going to dump her then or what? <laughs> and, then, like, and then go out with me. So, I mean, but maybe I'm just a, a moral dustbin. And Beth, I mean, Beth had been wronged, hadn't she? Her, her boyfriend 
that Vince had warned her about had run off with her best mate. So I guess obviously that is a bit, that is jarring, isn't it? And so she then speaks to Ben about how could anyone do that? And we're all thinking, oh, Evie, yeah, he did that. And instead of saying, look, you know what? Just to be totally clear. Um, but he didn't. And I thought they were going to leave that and there was going to be some awkward scene where they bump into Evie. But he's got it out of the way. The thing that disturbed me most was Bess was in that scene. Did you, did you hear Bess's incessant panting all I did. the way through the scene? I thought it was like a shunting steam train going all the way through. I was cooking, so I probably just I probably kept on um, stirring the pan unnecessarily, thinking it was something kind of catching or hissing. <laughs> I thought it was Ben hyperventilating under pressure at one point. <laughs> or or Beth was multitasking. I mean, fair play to her. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it was. And if that was the case, it was definitely not quite as dull a scene as I thought it was. Um, you know, Beth, Beth's little fists going like pistons <laughs> while she's simultaneously delivering Ben a lecture about the you know the comparative mor- morality of various different sort of dumping scenarios. Yeah, well, he, they were. He did take her up Lakey Hill on the date, didn't he? And he 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 pilfered Jill's fridge. <laughs> well, that's Leonard's job. <laughs> oh, as I said, it I was like, oh no. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I, you know, I, I am, I am, you know, I'm a fairly childish human being, but uh, pathetic euphemisms, as as we know, is my, you know, is my my jam, as I believe uh, people who used to be kids say. So they had, there was, yeah, they had the two dates, didn't they? They had the, they, they had the first date was when they took the picnic up Lakey Hill, and <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he took the space up Lakey Hill. Uh, yeah. He admired Pilf- the view there, and they then, did. Um, and then she insisted on a cold dip afterwards in the river. Yes, to go yeah. go to the perch, didn't they? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I mean, he didn't. When she asked about the am, he he neglected to say, "Oh, what well, you know." He's got Charlie Charlie's corpse in a state. Yeah. <laughs> Some of the family have been dumping chemicals in that, and and have now been permitted to go ahead and do it. I mean, under new regulations, Brian would probably be complete get off scot free now, wouldn't he? With all this new effluent. Oh, that would be a fantastic. That would be a fantastic plot line if um, Martha has some kind of defect, but it turns not to be a uh, fecal alcohol syndrome, but sort of like a set of gills from you know all the pollutant <laughs> that her grandfather her, 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 had dumped in the, the environment. Make it happen, script writers. <laughs> but uh, yes, I do you know what? You've, well done, you because um, maybe maybe everyone put that made that connection, but I hadn't made the connection that the AM was off limits because of the um, Brian's um, handiwork. Mm. Did he give a reason why the AM was? He just said you can't no. swim there, and I don't think he gave a reason. But then he said the perch, yeah, which is I mean we've heard in the last year we've heard Adam and Ian there, and then Harrison and. Fallon went for a dip. Oh, of didn't course, they? yeah, yeah. You were, yeah, of course, yeah. You were, you were quite taken by that, weren't you? Yeah, Fallon, Fallon had the shivers, didn't she? Your, you know, your um, lovely wife asking why your fingernails were buried deep into your thigh, <laughs> you <were> just, <laughs> and then banging the desk with your other fists, sort of just you know furiously. Yeah, we got to hear. Well, we got to hear about Harrison just slightly this week. He had a new barbecue, didn't he? Which is where Chris and Martha had gone round there. Which is why we found Brian and Jenny on their own doing their letter writing. Have you like have you like me gone down the um oh my god those those um eggs look quite good and then you you do you uh you realize how much they cost and you go well maybe I don't want one of those eggs actually I'm perfectly happy with a uh, 10 pound um, disposable barbecue from the co-op well it's been a long time since i mean you were you were t- recently you were quite um maybe you already were aware but you were you were quite disgusted at the lack of good barbecue facilities where you were uh, camping right yeah I th- well i mean i have been incredibly spoiled if you go camping in the state parks in california every single pitch has a full fire pit with a grill that goes over the top so it's you know it's absolute heaven it's incredible so you know if that's what harrison's got at home then you know it was definitely noteworthy enough to make it onto the arches. Was it noteworthy enough to make it onto the cider shed? That's for everyone else to decide. Yeah, sorry about that. It's just, it's just a, <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, that's my fault. But I, I, I was more criticising myself. But um, yes, uh, yeah, I, I, I no, I, you know, I've been very spoiled. Yeah, in Australia, the generally the just even the public parks, like the park you go to with your kids, will have coin-operated barbecues. 
that the clean council come and, barbecues. Yeah, that they come and clean down afterwards, so you can bring all your snags and everything there, and your burgers, and you can just fire away um, these like gas-fired um, coin-operated barbecues. Oh, 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 oh! I see what you mean. So, what? So it's like a um, so the gas is the the gas is the thing that's metered. Yes. Ah, okay. And you just put the coins in and fire it up for an hour or whatever, and cook your food and head off. Yeah, that I do. That's one of the things I like about my part of Southeast London is uh, it's just a Karen incident waiting to happen. Like you know, there's all the signs to say don't barbecue, but um, actually some of the parks a bit closer in have started to put up barbecuing facilities. But I don't know why they don't just kind of like start to make it, you know, start to actually embrace it and encourage it because people just you know go for gold anyway. Those disposable things. I mean, I think the last time I used one of those was on my fortieth. We all drove over to Ross Nola on the north. Uh, east uh, northwest coast of Ireland to do go surfing, and on the evening we did those on the beaches. They're not the most uh, pleasurable experience. I mean, it's just like being a Cure concert for the first thirty minutes with all the smoke coming back up into your face. So, well, you know, he hasn't aged very well. You'd you'd put up some kind of giant um, sort of like smoke screen if you if you know you know if you had to put on that much um, makeup and hairspray. Yeah, that's true. Where on earth have we gone to, Matthew? But, <laughs> Sorry, well, Peter. I, I feel it's no, my, it fault. my fault. It was definitely my fault. Well, it's our fault. We we have we have gone down a waffle hole, and it's now our job to try and claw our way out. Okay. Uh, so Harrison barbecue. Chris still dull, but that was noteworthy because he'd been there with Martha. Ben um, and Beth. Ben and Beth are in the perch. Um, it's hilarious, right? Because Beth, <laughs> she's such a character. She splashes him, and I, and then she says she's he's wet enough, so she drags him into the water. Exactly, <laughs> but not happened. But not before she got Beth to shake the remnants of the river all over him to oh, get him all God. wet already. Yeah, oh, incredible. She there was it got, got a bit sexy as well, though, didn't she, with her swimming costume? Yeah, but um, I mean. I, call me call me old fashioned, but uh, the idea of someone sort of squeezed into a swimming costume like it, like you know, like a sort of badly made sausage, doesn't sound that appealing. Sort of like sort of like a kind of folds of underboob spilling out. I don't think it was that. I think she was meant to look pretty fit, don't you? Ben was quite taken. The only thing that confused me was when they were talking. Like Ben was saying, he hadn't got something to go properly swimming in was that Beth then turned around and said, I've got my Nana's jeans. <laughs> I thought she was going to get Iris Case's flares and like wade into the perch or something and then like just see her disappear beneath the surface. I guess that's the kind of like the voices and the acting. So Nana Perch, sorry, Nana Casey does sound quite sort of lean and sort of like, you know, um, wiry, you know, as a person. She sounds like, you know, she's quite a thin woman. Um, but Vince does have a kind of fleshy, kind of like big, kind of bulky sound to him. So mm. I kind of, I think I bought into that. I thought that sort of um, Ben was after a bit more cushion for his push, and I thought that sort of Beth was daddy's girl, you know, especially with the enmity, the fact that they were kind of, you know, cut from the same cloth, which is why they were kind of like at, you know, at each other a bit. Yeah, maybe. I mean, let's see where they go with this couple. I wasn't completely enamored with either of their two um two scenes you don't think this is a long-term thing i think i think we're in for a it's a they're a long-term couple i'm pretty sure i th i think they might be um but it, they just didn't sell themselves to me this week and i think part of the problem was as well that casey wedding i was on holiday when that happened and i listened after the event right and it was just one of those things where i didn't get into it in the flow of that week of the episode because i'm s still kind of getting used to there being a sunday episode i don't know about you yeah, I, I have I haven't listened to one live. I mean, you know, by live I mean kind of you know in the evening, which is unusual mm -hmm. for me. I mean, I I very rarely am a day behind, but it's also I said this a couple of weeks ago. I under normal circumstances, not doing a not doing a podcast, I think I would have taken a hiatus. I think these last few weeks would have driven me to a little bit of a break from the archers. Oh no, I'm I'm quite enjoying the. I, mean, I know that we last week we were just saying how random it was, but I am almost reveling. In, in just how random it is and who knows there were theories last week i saw on social media that maybe that that very sparse casting was a cause of uh, maybe the the cast having to even lock down and they only had a few members of people to a few members of cast i mean oh. if you took if you took that story out last week the yacht the horse 
and whatever else the other two stories were, they were completely self-contained and they wouldn't, aside from Jenny mentioning that she had a chat with Lillian about the yacht on the horse, they just wouldn't exist. And I don't think we'll hear about them again. And I, it was strange. It was almost like something happened. They were like, go to the vault, get, get the yacht on the horse storyline. We need it. Well, maybe, you know, or the, or the actor who plays Lillian, you know, when she, when she re-upped on her contract, she had some kind of bizarre clause in there that was kind of like, yeah, she gets like a week long, uh, you know, week long special. It was, yeah. Anyway, let's, let's yeah, talk about we, that. It was that. absolutely dreadful. But I mean, this week, this week, you know, your light relief was supplied by um, Eddie and Joy, and it was nice to hear from them. Um, I mean, so yeah, I do, I, I, I do know what you mean. Like, it's not, it's not all bad this week, but I feel like I'm just carrying a bit of a grudge after, a, you know, like since the uh, that brilliant week where they were all at the uh, um, at um, oh help me out, what's the name? Lower Loxley. Lower Loxley. Since that brilliant week, thank you. I have I have been in a bit of a grump. It has been below path by by my tastes, but I will, I will admit this week there has been a few high points. Like hearing from Eddie and Joy was fun. Um, I did you know and did enjoy Thursday's episode, today's episode. But um, did you like me find the sort of light relief? Were you slightly distracted by Eddie's bad behaviour and how sort of out of character it was? He was being a bit of a shitbag to um, to Joy. Yeah, it was a total duffer of a gift. I mean, I can't imagine. Luckily, he got Joy in the swap because I don't think Roy would have been having too much fun on that trip. He'd have just been asking Eddie to drop him off at the nearest knocking shop in Felpersham, I think. And also joy is joy is smart enough and also mature enough to kind of not look at gift horse in the mouth. So she's like, right, it's Eddie. She, he's trying to shaft me. So I'll just, you know, I'll just uh, play possum and get as much company out of this as I possibly can. So if that involves watching him feed his turkeys or do a shift at the, you know, the local uh, market, then so be it. And, you know, only Joy could sort of do it with a smile on her face and kind of like, you know, so can, you know, she understands the transactionality of that. Like she's not kind of offended by it. But I did also, you know, it was very out of character for Eddie to be so kind of mercenary because ultimately driving her around for a couple of hours wouldn't cost him any money. Um, he had offered the prize, and wasn't he pretty much doing that for other people anyway, just sort of on the hope that they'd give him some cash? Yes, the hope that he'd get um, like gratuity money instead of direct cash, and then Rex got the hump with him because it was affecting his taxi service, didn't yeah. it? Yeah, so it would have been a lot more true to Eddie's character if he'd been like, you know, oh, we'll do this, this, and this, but of course, you know, a bit of help with this wouldn't go amiss, or, and of course I will have to pay the entry fee here, and this doesn't, you know, uh, the upkeep isn't, you know, it's not free, you know, like, you know, trying to kind of guilt Joy into giving him some money, that would have been maybe tr- more true to character. Yeah, it was meant to be the luxury lunch at Underwoods, but there was a little asterisk there, which basically just said, no lunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If you looked further down and checked the small print on the prize. Yeah, it was a bit... I felt a bit sad for Joy when she said she told all her mates. I was like, well, have you, though? Have mm. you told all of them? Maybe you've had a little boast about it in the WhatsApp group. Who who are her real friends in the village? I mean, Philip's gone, um, although she'd struck up a bit of a relationship with him. But Kirsty's a pal. Uh, Roy, I think, is a friend of hers. She's Fallon, definitely. Lee and Helen. Lee and Helen and now. the boys. Um, uh, obviously, Peggy's a convert after yeah. being initially very cold. Um, yeah, so she does have she does have some people in the village now who I think you know would give her the time of day. It is starting to be implausible that she's as lonely as she, you know, because we hear her having fun with people enough, and Linda and her have got a certain kind of you know, Linda's got a grudging respect for her. But wouldn't all of those people have known if she just said, oh, I'm going on Eddie's wonderful mystery tour? They would have no, all not. <laughs> yeah, they would have, surely someone would have come forward if they're a friend and just said, look, Joy, here's how it is. Um, but they didn't. And so Eddie's plan, I was a little bit dismayed that he didn't seize Oliver's idea as a tribute to Joe on what would have been his 100th birthday to just have a session. Um, with the cider club, which I thought would have been great. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Um, but he has now decided he's going to uh, Vladimir Putin style rig the flower and produce show, and at the end of the the mystery tour 
with joy, he discovered that she was going to enter in at least three categories that he had put in stooge candidates like Kira and Mia of the Grundies. So what would the, it was unusual bakes, wasn't it? That was one of the categories. Can you remember what her, what she won last year in the unusual no, bakes? No, no, I, I, I no, this was, this is all, this is, you know, the, think- these were my, these were my chuckle along to the archers moments this week. So unusual bakes, she won with her vegan lamingtons. Um, she then said that the judges commented that her rainbow buttonholes were spectacular. And then she won, she won the photo- photography competition, which was basically taking a photo of Peggy's rabid cat leaping at her. <laughs> she is a bit of a polymath, <laughs> isn't she? I mean, she does seem to have an extraordinary range, range of abilities and interests. Yeah, and that actually pours cold water on this theory that she's Kaiser Soze verbal kin because she's managed to do all of this in a short space of time in Ambridge. Who's to say that she hasn't done all of these other things that she says she's done in the past up in East Shields or wherever she's from. So yeah, I think that, um, that adds weight to that, that theory that she's lived, she's lived a full life. I think she might, I think she might be one of my favorite characters at the moment. Um, I think I really, um, her, like you were, you were pining for Jim last week. And mm. there are Lillian has fallen off the list controversially. Um, um, Kerry does not like Lillian. I don't think I vaguely remember that. I don't know. I, th- I think Kerry's not a fan of Lillian, and th- I think it's basically centres around the fact she finds the chuckle annoying or the cackle. I think she just considers it a cackle and a G and T, and not much else beyond that. Doesn't yeah, she? but I think we all have obviously Kerry. It's Brian, you. It's uh, Fallon and Jim. But I think my, you know, like any any type of joy interaction or Vince or Jim and I'm, I'm happy. Give me that. And, you know, I'll say, I'll sign off on that episode. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I, you know, so I, I feel like she's, um, she's, I think she's going to get bigger. I hope she's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger in the, in, in, you know, in the show. And I mean, something that's been tugging at everyone's heartstrings and I know Kerry didn't like hearing it was just how badly Neil was treating Susan Mm. in these, these recent weeks. So we, this situation came to a head this week, didn't it? With Susan, all, initially it started with where they've been for weeks these awkward cross purposes or neil's not even listening co- conversations where she's offering him a cup of tea or something and then then the bombshell where's the lasagna dish so it's ryan shula's i'm going ryan shula's to get the lasagna dish what did you make of that scene when she went round there um what when season went round there yeah the initial scene where it all came out um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I assume that lasagna dish has been sort of, sort of wrapped in a tea towel and quietly smashed into dust at this point, you know, for, for the fact it's been polluted by living in, you know, Shula's cupboard for a couple of weeks. That's, I mean, I'm not a petty man or a particularly superstitious man, but I don't think I'd want to keep um, a dish that had played such a you know, crucial role in the, in the, you know, betrayal of my marriage. But, um, yeah, I, I found, I found it very, very sad I, I didn't find it particularly moving when I was listening to it, but then later on I sort of thought about it and I kind of like contextualized it with sort of my life. And I just thought about how humbling and, and miserable that must be where you're so desperate to find out what's happening in your marriage that you kind of, you go and throw yourself at the feet of your potential love rival to just to try and, you know, like find out exactly what's going on. Yeah. She goes around there and she hears that, all these jobs he'd done. And then there was that moment where she said, Oh, so I've been on, I've been on my knees with Martha and all that time he was here instead. So he'd rather be here than be with me. He took then, you up Lakey Hill. Yes. <laughs> he took me up Lakey Hill. Oh my God. Neil. So, sorted your paving out. Yeah. Did your weeding. And then he was going to clear out your shed. I think those were the tasks in hand, weren't they? Yeah. But then she, she managed, she managed to go back and have this. Well, first of all, they had a they had a blazing row, didn't they? Um, about whether what they were going to eat that evening, and she was like, well, "How about lasagna?" And he was like, "Well, that takes ages." And she was like, "Yeah, it does, doesn't it?" <laughs> like it was like a major gotcha. Yeah, yeah, I was I was waiting for my car to be uh, um, MOT'd, and when I was listening to that, so I was walking around the park on my own, um, and so I really was concentrating, and that was absolutely brilliantly acted. Yeah, scene. and she, she said it's quite, quite sorry Peter. 
no no but you know exactly what i was just gonna basically echo what you were saying like yeah and, and it made you to think i mean lasagna is not a particularly romantic dish but it is involved it's time consuming to do mm-hmm. well yeah she said quite a special dish like she was really gonna like you know give him enough rope um so he he storms off and then the next thing we hear is the you know what i didn't like and i heard it again neil's wobble he had it when he was trying to bring emma back from the brink yes oh yes and then he happened again when he said you're starting to scare me when and we suddenly realized well i'm going to come back to a theory here but in i because i think he he realized later after the event but in mm. terms of still loving his wife absolutely he does you know and he was there saying you know you're starting to scare me and then she had the two main questions you want to ask them and this was another one where i think i had a little chuckle when she was like how did you feel when shula fell off the horse and i was in the kitchen i was like i can answer that yeah exactly (laughs) yeah Uh, around around the country a chorus was just like brilliant (laughs) Yeah, it was this, the sound of like six million cans of skull opening. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, yeah, I, it was it was tragic when she opened her eyes. Um, and I mean, she's not real. <laughs> I'm allowed to wish her dead. I've had enough of it. I know. The second question was quite disappointing. Are you in love with Shula? Because I think we all knew that he wasn't. The whole thing was well acted, as I said, and um, I thought it was well scripted. But Neil's, the, the, the gap in it for me was the ideal idea that Neil wasn't worldly enough that when his wife was upset and bringing, you know, and obviously reacting to what he'd been up to, that he, the scales didn't fall from his eyes and he wasn't able to then be more apologetic and more understanding. Like Susan had to really spoon feed in the information before he understood what was going on. Um, and you know, at the end he did say sort of, uh, oh, you know, Shula did, Shula did warn me about, you know, the tongues might start wagging and, yeah. um, and it's like, yeah, but why is it taking these two women to effing well point this out to you? Yeah. I mean, there was that scene that, that part that S- Susan said to him, you know, we had this beautiful evening at Grey Gables and you, you barely said a word to me. And he was like, oh, I was enjoying my- the last. Um. <laughs> yeah well here's my question to you peter you know kerry is coming to porto next month yeah if me and kerry go out for a candlelit dinner and she orders the lamb main and then goes very silent should we just assume that the pod is no more or is she just enjoying her meal i mean you can just create a manuscript based on the on the script and then we can you can just read it verbatim kerry's you know, just, i was enjoying the lamb <laughs> But the reason I think it went full circle, because Neil did go to visit Shula in the stables. She got two visitations, didn't she? But Neil went first. Mm. And he said, yeah, you were right about the gossip. And then he said, you know, at the house, I've been dealing with Martha, Chris not being there, Susan having all this trouble, Brian and Jennifer. And then there was all the stuff with Alice. And he's like, I think I was treating this place as a safe haven. So he did get it. Yeah, eventually. But I mean, I mean... Basically, Shula, what you mistook for love was me just desperately trying to avoid dealing with a child. I know. That was great, wasn't it? Yeah. And then he said, I won't be dropping in uninvited. And he was like, bye. And then she was like, bye. Actually, to be, you know, to be fair, they the script writers have listened to us. Shula got, you know, got an absolute kicking this week. And yes. I didn't take any pleasure in it. Because, like, I mean, despite my, my irritation with Shula is not sort of vengeful or unpleasant, like, oh, I did just wish her dead. But, um, you know, like, you know, like the, the character, I don't wish any particular ill. But but also that the the, the uh, um, revenge is a dish best served cold. Um, Susan's Susan's handing over of the envelope full of cash on Thursday's episode was, you know, that was devastating. Yeah, that was like Tom Hagen going to visit Jack Waltz to get Johnny Fontaine the part in The Godfather, wasn't it? She goes down to the stables. I insist <laughs> like yeah. handing over the money <laughs> to pay for three riding lessons. It was basically an offer, offer that Shula couldn't refuse. And then Shula was like, oh, there's no need because... She, and then Susan was like, because what? <laughs> yeah, it was it was fantastic, and actually, you know, I mean, that does uh, yeah that that I did really enjoy today. To be fair, um, uh, after all my griping and moaning earlier on, um, I enjoyed Brian. Um, I enjoyed um, Susan. I thought she was fantastic. So you know, the rest of it, I could kind of um, 
turn a blind eye to. I mean, we we may yet on Sunday hear that Shula wakes up to find Banjo's head at the foot of her duvet. <laughs> if you need a horse's head to, to sever, then Shula's, you know, makes the job easier, doesn't it, to do it to Shula? Uh, um, Absolutely. Yeah, but I but uh, um, so I feel that um, this week's pod has been a kind of a fairly good analog to the archers i think i feel like you have been the susan of the of the show uh um, professional competent funny um uh, and you know informative and i have been a waffle uh waffle monger oh you see i couldn't even say that I couldn't even get waffle monger out so thank you matthew i feel like you pr- you feel like you've carried me this week and prone to gossip maybe susan is are you saying the same about me i love a bit of gossip you, 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 i mean you are prone to gossip actually aren't you you are a bit I'm of a... terrible. I mean, the moment the moment the recording stops, it's just uh, it, like uh, the microphones light up. Well, you and Kerry have a. Um, how can I put this delicately? You and Kerry have a what I would des- describe as a kind of unhealthy fixation with um, with certain cultural outpourings, and I I watch this with a kind of dark fascination. Um, because obviously, you know, like, you know, your, yours and Kerry's lives, it's not that, I mean, I would participate happily, except for the fact that, um, you know, my life is a little less predictable at the moment. Is that fair to say? I think yeah, I'm trying, I'm, I'm, I'm becoming, um, yeah, I think it's better. It's fair to say that, you know, if something becomes, uh, less salacious and less interesting, it's quite easy to walk away from. So I'm going, you know, I try to, I try to not gossip about things which aren't interesting. But as Peter Cook once said in defense of private eye, if I met someone who said they didn't like gossip, I'd be meeting a liar. Yeah. And I, I think um, I was trying to explain to someone about um, someone was saying to me about like, uh, you know, you know, the people who say, oh, you know, I hate football, you know, like I can't stand football. Why is football on all the time? I'm so bored of football. And I was trying to explain to them that, you know, they 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 didn't understand that for a large majority of football fans, it's basically a giant gossip fest. Oh, and do you see what he did on the pitch? And you'll never guess what this happened. And then he said this, and she, you know, she said that. And then this tackle went in, and he reacted like this. Like, I mean, the skill is, you know, like it's in, it's entertaining, and actually the game's entertaining. But the, I think for a lot of people, the large, the large point of interest is all of the kind of hoopla that surrounds it, which is, you know, it's almost it's it's, it's like you know, it's like the you know the um, the mask singer or kind of um, you know, Amer- uh, Britain's Got Talent or something. Yeah, I think it's there is also an element of it that it just helps you have personal rivalries, doesn't it? Battles with other people. I mean, you've only just got, go to football Twitter and just see how supporters of the same club will just rip each other to shreds. I mean, look at a club as dysfunctional as Arsenal. I mean, they, (laughs) they, the success, despite being pinned to the bottom of the table of all their YouTube channels is incredible. I mean, if, if, if I ever had a son, or a daughter, and they came to me and said, I want to be an Arsenal fan, I would just show them all the Arsenal social media and YouTube, and they would quickly change their mind. It's a, it's a long lifetime engagement with misery. Yes, yes, dear listener, Kerry is an Arsenal fan. Um, <laughs> and not and here to defend not herself. Here to herself. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I, this is, this is not, this is not bravado. This is not said for comedic effect. I genuinely have a problem with the fact you're a Chelsea fan. Like it upsets me. Like I know, I know. No, you've told me. You've told me. That's fine. I mean, you're such a nice guy, and you are ca- caring and considerate, and like there is no side to Matthew at all. Like you know, what you see is what you get. He's a very straight shooting man, but he's a Chelsea fan. Like the two, the the, the two things. It's like um, it's like oil and water. They just how is you know you can anyway. It just doesn't make any sense. But I, you know, I I hate Chelsea with such uh, undiluted um, um, passion. It's 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 quite weird actually how much I dislike Chelsea. But you know, anyway, not as much as Tottenham. I hate them more. Okay. Um... And West Ham, are they completely off the hook? West Ham, are, you know, the thing is, West, West Ham are a detestable team, but they're my team. So, you know, I mean... Yeah, that's how it works, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I... I but I don't... This is the thing. Okay, so here, I think this is why I dislike Chelsea so much, because a lot of Chelsea fans are in complete denial. I don't think you are, but I think a lot of Chelsea fans are in complete denial about the worst excesses of their supporters. And No, absolutely not. I mean, I, I've, I've, I've been to games of the pre... Abramovich era where I've had to go into the side of the stands and and this was in in an era where 
you would tell the steward you'd heard somebody hurling racist abuse and the steward would just shrug his shoulders, despite in the programme saying that there was a, a kick it out campaign. I think now they actually might do something. Yeah. This is like I, Matthew Harding lower and you go and tell the steward and you're just like, what do you expect me to do about it? There's 20 you, of them. You are, I will, I will say this is, in this, I do find this astonishing. You are slowly chipping away at my hatred of Chelsea. So that is, that is, I mean, that is, a powerful statement about our, our friendship. Well, you are one of many lovely West Ham fans that I know. So. <laughs> okay. I don't believe that, but thank you. I'll, it's I'll, true. I'll take, it, I'll take it sincerely. I, I mean, I, you know, I used to live in a Millwall sporting um, area and uh, you know, like my, they, they very patiently explained to me why I should hate being a West Ham fan. And they were quite convincing. I will, I will say, um, Matthew, yes. we, we've now talked about football for about five or six minutes. Well, it, it was either that or Highlander, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, it's still out there. Um, uh, I just said, let me check the emails. Um, I haven't actually, uh, let me just check. Cider shed. No, nope, no emails requesting a, um, we had, I got some Twitter feedbacks and Facebook feedback saying they'd be up for some Highlander chat. Would we break our, would we break our rules and potentially seeing as it's a format shattering, um, concept, would we break our rules and throw open, uh, the Highlander, Highlander episode to other um, correspondents. Who knows? Let's see. I mean, we've talked about it being a kind of a, a lost episode special, haven't we? I'm sure we'll find time to do it at some point. But um, I did like one theory that uh, we could do like a fan fiction where Jill and Peggy are actually training for the final battle on Lakey Hill as the two. Jill would win. Jill's do the think? Christopher Lambert character. Yeah, she's you know she's the uh, she's the reluctant warrior. Uh, mm. Peggy, Peggy's, you know, the, the Kurgan, um, sort of bloodlusted, um, you know, sort of the, the thrill of the kill, but sort of, but, that, you know, can't push himself beyond his sort of, you know, beyond the kind of the, the banality and sort of like the, the, the thinness of his sort of like bloodlust. Maybe Peggy's fashioned a, ma- uh, a mighty broadsword from overcooked flapjacks. Okay, this is kind of gold that you can look forward to if you do push us towards a... <laughs> Highlander special. <laughs> okay, if if you do want a Highlander special, then you can get in contact with our Twitter. We are at the Cider Shed Pod. Um, you can get in contact via Facebook. That is at the Cider Shed Podcast, which is a Facebook group. Or you could even look up our Instagram, which I managed to um, post at least one meme last week of Kerry. Um, and we are. The same as Twitter on that, we are at the Cider Shed Pod on Instagram. So, and Peter handles the emails, which is yeah, hello at the Cider Shed dot com. Maybe you know, um, if you if we manage to get maybe five people requesting a Highlander episode, that could be enough. I think I think the 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 um the clamor doesn't need to be very big. No, no, absolutely not. Mm. Uh, well, Matthew. As I said, thank you for carrying me. It is, it felt like a heavy burden that you had to shoulder, and I, I do appreciate it. Well, you know, Chelsea are generally carrying West Ham anyway, aren't they? So, I'll just say Joe Cole, um, Frank Lampard. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Hello.